What did success mean to you 15 years ago? And what does success mean to you today? Okay, 15 years ago, success meant to me um, having a really big salary, uh, posh offices being, you know, uh, having all of the trappings, um, the classic materialism, you know, she's she's important, she has lots of she has lots of people that do what she says, she earns lots of money and she's, you know, really respected. It was very individual, very materialistic and very ego driven. And I think I'm at the other side of it now. And do you know what success means to me now is just being able to have the courage to define your own reality and to live in it. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's different to other people's. So Nick, who are you? Um, I wish I knew. So uh, honestly, I do genuinely wish I knew. I thought I knew who I was, but I, I only really knew one dimension. And I think we're all lots of different dimensions. It's just a matter of whether we're lucky enough to find them or not. Um, I, I'm still finding mine. Where was your life, say, 10 years ago? 10 years ago, I was somebody that was trying to prove to the world that I could do it all. I think I was very, very driven by um, an ego which had been dented. I think I'd been, you know, I was living in that world where I was very armoured up. I was, you know, quite, um, very if aggressive is the right word, but certainly very ambitious. You know, I had a nanny, I had the au pair, you know, I was in the, you know, executive home and all the rest of it. And it was, it was a bit of an illusion really, but I didn't know it at the time. Yeah. I was determined to go out there and, you know, build this six figures of six figure business and be seen as a success. And I was so driven. And during that period, I was actually also, you know, newly married and pretty much pregnant full time for five, well, not five years, because obviously not an elephant, but, you know, I had three children in five years. And I built the business when I was pregnant and giving birth to my first two children. I mean, it was always a joke, actually. Some of the consultants who worked for me actually had my midwife's number because I would still be traveling the day before I was due. Um... Uh, luckily, both the boys were late, so they, they obviously knew I got deadlines. To meet. <laughs> there was just lots of plates spinning, and um, yeah, a little while later they crashed. What was the um, the catalyst? Do you know, it was. It's, it's funny how um, you know I'm a great believer in if you don't if you don't listen to your instincts and the signs. I do, I do think Mother Nature steps in. I do think something bigger than ourselves steps in, whatever that may be. And there was a few things that happened. So the financial crash happened now you know we were uh, management consultants my husband had joined the business that I'd set up um, and our clients were severely affected by the financial crash so although we kept our clients you know we went from fee earning five days a week to maybe one day a week you know so our fees were severely our turnover was severely impacted by the financial crash um, and that happened at the same time as me giving birth to my second son and looking back, it's pretty obvious to me that that's really when I think the onset of postnatal depression came. But I was just too busy keeping the show on the road to be able to to stop for it. But I just remember, um, I, I just remember feeling so incredibly sad and heartbroken, and and feelings I hadn't recognised before. You know, about having to go back to work and leave my son, and I, I didn't have any choice because. You know, bankruptcy wasn't an option for us. We had to be able to pay our bills and make our way and so forth. And it was also the first time in my life that I'd ever really faced that kind of, well, failure really. Because my whole career had been an uphill, you know, everything has always been going up. And even when I had my rejection in the corporate world, um, I just left and went on, built my own little empire. So I didn't stop going up. And for the first time, you know, I had the physical stuff happening out there that I had no control over a financial crash which we were all affected by and as a small company we didn't have the layers of security that other companies had I mean luckily you know we had been we had been very conservative and we did have you know money put away um but we pretty much had to use it all to you know make stuff redundant and completely revamp the business into something that was sustainable and on the other side of me, I had all of this kind of emotional and personal stuff happening, bringing in all these dimensions and feelings that I hadn't realised. And the third thing was around that time, my sister's husband uh, was diagnosed with motor neuron disease. And um, 
so he lived overseas and I, you know, he's been in my life since I was 12 years old, you know, very, very close. And I think those things collided. And um, that really, I think, was the can of worms being opened. I had to really swallow my pride. Um, it was a really difficult time. I had to make lots of people redundant. We changed our business to being an associate-based business so that, you know, uh, it was much more sustainable. My husband actually um, left and decided to go back into the corporate world because, you know, he's, he saw his job very much as providing stability for us. And as both being in a small business, wasn't going to provide that stability. And maybe, I don't know whether subconsciously, maybe he saw that the writing was on the wall in terms of me changing. Um, and we left our executive home, uh, which we didn't own. We were renting and we actually moved back into where we are now, which is, you know, what I always refer to as our, you know, completely beautiful, but impractical and small cottage. But we did it because we only needed one salary to be able to pay for it. That's huge, absolutely enormous. And to get through that, because you're also battling the emotional and the physical, all these aspects together, what what took you through that or what got you through that? Really interesting question. I mean, I think, you know, I think I've got a really... Um, <laughs> I always laugh at myself. I'm such a classic management consultant. So, you know, I have, you know, a disaster recovery plan. You know, I cover my bases. So <laughs> I think um, whilst all of this was going on, I think I instinctively knew I had to put some safety measures in place so my husband Nick um, took one if you like work stream so he basically um, left the business went back to the corporate world and covered off the let's be stable let's make sure we've got a salary coming in every month he was the one that said okay we're going to go back and live in the cottage you know small outgoings uh, and, and, and it could become manageable um, I um, I've got a very close and supportive family um, who I spent a lot of time with um, and was very, you know, I, I don't live in a family where I have to hide things. So it was OK that, you know, I would just turn up at my mum and dad's or my sister's and, you know, just be in floods of tears that day or be sharing to them that, you know, I had to go and do something awful like, you know, make my favourite employee uh, redundant or something like that. So I had a lot of family support and my dad had run his own business for many, many years. So you know, he was he was fantastic because he'd been through this. You know, he'd been through this before. You know, he'd had the ups and downs. Um, I then put, you know, the blocks in place. So I, um, you know, had a very, developed a very good relationship with my GP. And that, you know, is, is more than a, you know, just my doctor. It's something that I can really, I really have a relationship of friendship with and I can be very honest with her. Um, we made the business much smaller so I could start reining back and going part time. Um, and as all that was going on, uh, I was pregnant with our third child, our daughter. And, and that really was, that solidified things in a way, because that made the decision that, you know, I was going to rain back from work. I wasn't going to try and be this person that had it all anymore. Nick was covering off paying the bills, keeping this stable. Uh, I slowly ramped down the business and made the decision that um, I was pretty much going to stop work and uh, just focus on the children, be able to travel out to my sister and spend time with, with her, and um, I guess just get my head around being a parent. Um, and then when I had my daughter, I think that's when the full onslaught of postnatal depression came, and, and I actually believe it's because, I know this sounds a bit weird, and it's not that anybody wishes to have postnatal depression, but it's almost like I made space for it. Yeah. And, and whilst it was a, a very difficult time, it, it was also a really transformational time, you know, because um, I wasn't really, I mean, I, I don't think I could get through a shop, shop in the supermarket without standing in tears. You know, it was, it, it was, it was quite, um, it was quite raw and emotional. Um, <laughs> and luckily me being me didn't really care. I'm quite happy to get, try in a supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm beyond it. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, so I, again, you know, because the, the GP, um, I was with my GP a lot and um, Nick was very supportive. And what we actually did, because he was having to work away a lot and I was just feeling so overwhelmed and honest to God, you know, parenting is the hardest job in the world. Give me, give me the worst consultancy job that anybody's done and it's a walk in the park in comparison, honestly it is. Um, 
And I did, uh, when it was really at its height, I took uh, antidepressants for six months. I know they're not for everybody. I'm very, I think I just, I'm very agnostic about it. I think it's a really personal decision between you and your GP. And I, that's exactly where I am on it. For, for me, it was the right decision because there was so much going on. I just couldn't keep up with it. I just couldn't keep up with it. And I just needed, the way my GP explained it was, it's kind of like just you know, giving yourself a little bit of respite to allow your brain to catch up and process. And she was spot on and she promised me, she said, six months to the day, Nick, you won't need them anymore and you'll be on top of this. And she was right. She was absolutely right. Almost six months to the day we started the process of coming off them. But it gave me some space. It just gave me some space to to collect my thoughts, to adjust to this massive transition from from being somebody who earned six figures, who ran a big business, who was completely fueled by ego, who really didn't have a relationship with her children because I had nannies and no pairs, to somebody who got up every day and met somebody else's needs, didn't get any external feedback. You know, even if I'd wanted to have an ego, I couldn't have one because nobody really cared about it. You know, babies don't care about egos. And... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and 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 also just process what was happening and yeah that's kind of how I got through it I I think and just being really honest the big thing that hit me at that time with postnatal depression and I think I mentioned this to you was when I'd been to the doctor and it was such a weight off my mind and the doctor but she knew me so well she was like you know this this isn't you being weak Nick this isn't you um being a bad mother because I I'm like you know I don't believe there could be any mother as bad as me because everybody seems to be holding it together and I'm not so therefore I must be on my own here there must be something missing I wasn't made right there must be something missing because I should be able to do this you should just naturally love your children and you should just naturally be able to hold it all together and I can't so therefore there's something wrong with me and my GP was like, that's not the case at all. You are so not on your own. This is really, really common. And actually, we need to be able to talk about it. And I remember going into the school playground and just being really, really honest with the mums and saying, you know what? I'm not great. I'm not really managing. Um, I've been diagnosed with personal depression. I am going to take some antidepressants. I do need some help. Uh, and one of the reasons I told people was because we decided that we would um, hire a part-time mother's help in the evening. Because my husband worked away, I had three children under five that I was trying to get to bed. And, you know, for example, Lily, my daughter, it would take me at least an hour to feed her and settle her. And the boys were only four and three. So where do I put them for an hour on their own? Because if they're in the room with me with the baby, then, I, you know, it's a vicious circle. Then I can't get the baby to sleep. And by that time of the day, you're so exhausted. What little bit of resilience you did have has just gone out the window. Um... And so I said, you know, do you know anybody who could come in between six and eight every night, two hours a day, just to help me with that really difficult period of getting all the children to bed and just um, giving me a breather? And it was amazing because all of these other mums started saying to me, yeah, 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 we're in the same boat, Nick. And I'm like, have you got any idea how much I needed to know that? Have you got any idea? Because I, I genuinely, sorry if I cry. I generally thought it was me. I generally thought that there was something wrong with me because everybody else kept it together. But it's not. It's not like that. It's not like that at all. And that, that's, I think, when I kind of went, I don't care if I look a bit of an arse. If me standing up and just one person hearing something makes them understand that, you know, they're not weird, they're not isolated, there's not something missing, then, then it's worth it. Because that day in the playground was massive... I can't tell you, it was like the, one of the biggest, most profound moments of my life hit me in the face when I went, oh my God, it's, it's all an optical illusion. It's all an optical illusion. And I've been, I've been trying to hit this standard. I was never going to hit because it's not humanely possible. And, and, and I, I guess, guess that was a turning point. So people write, don't talk about it. People aren't open enough. We have to keep up this facade of we're perfect, we're great. And if we're not, then something's wrong with us. And I noticed that with your LinkedIn posts, you've continued that to today. Like, I, I first met you, obviously, via LinkedIn. And your posts are just so full of honesty and just really honest, open thoughts and feelings. And it's the kind of thing that I think we, we're becoming more used to, but we're not doing enough. And I just found that the more I shared my stuff and was honest, that the layers on other people fell away. 
and they were honest back to me. Um, and I also found that um, I could start to have more true connections with people and you know this whole thing is self-fulfilling because then the pressure started to be taken off me I didn't have to pretend so you know for many years you would never have seen me you know without makeup on my hair done and a lovely outfit and all the rest of it and and you know now sometimes I'll be dressed up to the nines and and sometimes I'll just look like I've come out the back of a bush you know because there's something about when you um kind of take off, I know Brittany Brown talks about, you know, taking off your armour, how whatever words we want to use. When you're just yourself, people just see you. You know, they don't see whether you've, you know, I don't I don't think I can my makeup bag for about two years. You know, <laughs> by the time it did I couldn't, you know, my skull was clumped together, it'd been so long since I've had time to point a makeup on. And <laughs> and and I think there is something about um it, you know, stepping forward and it is a bit like going to the gym. Or a bit like doing something for the first time. You know, the first time you go out for a run, you think your lungs are going to explode. And you think, why on earth do people do this? This is just, this is, this is just physical S and M. It's just ridiculous. But then, by the sixth or seventh time you've been out for a little run, you're going, oh, actually, I feel quite liberated. I'm feeling quite good. The endorphins are going, and you know, um, actually, I can, you know, I can actually sit down, you know, without something killing me. And it's a little bit like that about showing up and owning up, as I call it, and just being really honest. It does get easier because you just you just get used to not having to put a filter in front of what you're saying. And what is so lovely is that the person that responds back to you really connects and they don't put a filter on either. And, it, and it's interesting because the people who do put a filter on, and there's something so true in this, there are a couple of people that I've had a really kind of resistant kind of almost physical want to step back from them because I know there's a filter there and and that is actually what disconnects me I'm not disconnected by the truth I'm actually pulled in by that because I I really admire the courage even if the truth's difficult or you might fill out your depth with some of the stuff people's telling you I mean you, you don't have to have a solution you're not you're not telling them what to do you're just you're just being non-judgmental and just allowing them to own their story. And Nick, you honestly just literally managing the <laughs> hell out of life. And tell me about the business you're running at the moment. It's, a business, it's more like a lifestyle business or lifestyle transformation. There's nickdavis.com, which is effectively, at its heart, it's about transformation. That's what it's really about. And I've actually merged what was my management consultancy kind of persona and my experience and skills. Because I, I spent 20 odd years doing, you know, pretty big transformation projects. But I've merged that with the lifestyle part. So, you know, there's organisational transformation or individual. But actually, I think the two are just so interlinked because ultimately it doesn't matter what process or methodology or how you want to look at your organisation. Effectively, you're looking at people. You're looking at getting people to do something differently. Um, and I think the way that the world is going and the way that, you know, our new sounds a bit. Uh, I don't know if it's the right word, but you know, I think there's definitely a new level of consciousness and a, a new level of, you know, what, what success, success is and what people want from life. I set up a business named after my daughter called Lily Isabella, um, and it's uh, lilyisabella.co.uk, and that's just because after I had my daughter, I realised that she was quite creative, and I quite I like, like making things. things. And I quite like designing clothes. So Lily Isabella is just very much a, again, it's lifestyle, but it's about. Um, it's about beautiful, pretty things. My very quirky approach and saying, actually, I don't think we need to buy new. I don't think we need to follow the crowd. I think we need to use our imagination. Get yourselves in the charity shops. Get yourselves in the flea markets. Get yourself good seamstress. And this is the kind of stuff you can come up with. And Nick, lastly, what are your top three books? Number one, I think, is Lost Connections by Johan Hari, uh, which he talks about looking at depression from a different perspective. And the thing that sticks in my mind is that um, individualism and materialism is effectively KFC for the soul. And that maybe depression is a perfectly reasonable response to a set of unreasonable circumstances. And maybe, you know, we are looking at this in the wrong way, but it's a really, it's, it's a really interesting read. And I really like his perspective. Second one, um, I just love Mark Manson. Um, I'm reading his book um, about a book about hope, his latest new bestseller. I can't remember the full title. Sorry, uh, menopausal moment where I forget things. But it's Mark Manson. 
and he writes, he did the first book, which was um, How Not to Give a F-U-C-K. And he's just done a sequel, which is a book about hope. And again, somebody who speaks in really, really tangible, approachable, accessible language. Um, but it's so deeply researched. It's like just modern day philosophy. And just the pair of them, they, they look at things slightly differently, but they're really good. And I know the third's meant to be a book, but it's not because the third, sorry, if it's a book, the third one is any book by Dave Trott, who's an advertiser, who's the best storyteller I have ever found in my life. I love him. I just love him so much um, because he just tells really interesting stories uh, that all have a profound meaning. But if I could just add the fourth thing, um, my I have crushes on people and my massive crush, my fourth massive crush is Hannah Gatsby. I don't know if you watched the Nanette. Wow. She's a role model for me. She is somebody that has redefined owning your story and having the courage to stand up there and tell it. She's amazing. 